Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner. I'm inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me on a retreat next summer so we can explore together the craft of preaching. The three of us will take to the road to host this preacher's retreat, July 29 through August 2, 2024, at the Ghost Ranch Retreat Center. It's located in the remote and beautiful high desert north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the awe-inspiring terrain that Georgia O'Keeffe painted. As we're all together in residence at Ghost Ranch for four nights, our program will include presentations, panel discussions, corporate worship, lectionary-based Bible overviews, small group discussions, and preaching workshop exercises, all designed to enhance your gifts as a biblical preacher. You'll meet colleagues in ministry and feed your soul in a contemplative and sacred landscape. To get more information and to sign up, you can find a link on Working Preacher's homepage, or you can go to ghostranch.org, click on Workshops and Retreats, and type Working Preacher into the search box. The program cost is $350 per person. In addition, Ghost Ranch has different kinds of lodging options available for you to purchase, depending upon what kind of a retreat accommodation you desire. There is a cap on enrollment at 75 participants, and limited scholarship funds are available through Ghost Ranch. So sign up today. I hope you will join us there for this unique opportunity. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The texts for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost on September 24th, 2023, are these. Jonah 3.10 through 4.11, or if you're following the semi-continuous first reading, Exodus 16, verses 2 through 15. The psalm is number 145, verses 1 through 8. The second reading, we're beginning a series in Philippians, chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. And the gospel reading is Matthew 20, 1 through 16. One of the, this is on the Mount Rushmore of parables for me, like top four parables. Is that like, is that a good thing to be on Mount Rushmore? That's a good question, right? There's, there's, yeah. the, there are various Mount Rushmores. In terms of a parable that uh, speaks a strange word of grace, I think it's on that, it's on that Mount Rushmore. Um, Got it. An offensive word of grace almost, but um, something yeah. that just shows you that uh, the ways of the kingdom are not in line with our familiar conventions. I like that in the parable. Yeah, and we should say that that's really this this next section of Matthew um, going forward, 20, and then after, uh, after the entrance into Jerusalem, we've got three more parables coming up. That we're entering a really, uh, I think, a challenging portion of Matthew for a lot of preachers to, uh, I think one of the homiletical challenges is, is recognizing, as you said, uh, Matt, how these parables are really challenging the, the status quo, the empire, the leaders, uh, and really presenting, you know, Jesus, uh, God's kingdom in very um, countercultural kinds of ways and challenging ways. And so, uh, and so I, I think a preacher needs to kind of get their, get her head around. That's what we're, that's what we're up to coming, coming up here in this portion of Matthew, but also, uh, also to maybe, I think one of the challenges also for parables is, is how, how to engage a little bit in the specificity of it so that not every sermon sounds the same, even though we know that Jesus is, does that make sense? So even though that we know that Jesus is kind of, these are going to be critiques against the leaders and critiques against uh, the, the way in which um, the way in which empire works and the way in which the, you know, institutions work and, and criticisms of that and challenges to that. So how does a preacher then engage in these parables with a kind of an angle into sort of the specificity of this particular, this particular parable? Mm -hmm. I appreciate that in one way, it's identifying um, 
uh, looking ahead and identifying the overall direction um, that if you're going to be preaching through these parables, what what's the overall direction that you want to hit? Um, what point do you want to make sure that uh, your community leaves um, uh, pondering? Um, I I would I would rather say let them ponder it than to say that you've told them this is what they have to think. Um, uh, give them a way of reflecting how to think, but in doing that. Uh, recognize that while there is a familiarity in what is being communicated in each of these parables in general, what Jesus has done is to use their real life diverse situations, um, their experiences, where they are, um, to to say this isn't just something that's going to happen to this group of people. This is a way of life no matter where your sphere of influence is. And when you take that in mind, you know where you're going um, but you also have to linger, as you said, Caroline, in the specificity of the particular text that uh, you're reading that particular Sunday, you're working with. Well, for me, it's always to find the moment of absurdity. I think almost all the parables have some moment where everybody who was listening would just start laughing hysterically or would think like, yeah, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, nobody loans their enslaved person 10,000 talents you know and in this case it's obviously the 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 payment where the guy starts off by paying the, the people who worked for an hour the full wage which is kind of like we don't know landowners who who do that right and then of course the refusal to uh, increase the wages for people who worked more hours and i think that's the that's just not how it works and it's not it's not how you run a vineyard uh nobody's going to show up to work tomorrow morning at 9 a.m if you keep doing this but i think there's an absurdity also in the sense where the the full day workers their complaint isn't uh you're you're cheap the complaint isn't we want more the complaint is you made those people equal to us yeah which I find really fascinating because the people who worked an hour are probably not the strongest. They're probably not the healthiest. They're probably not the most desirable. They're probably not the team players, right? There's nothing suggests that they're lazy. That's not why they weren't hired. They weren't hired because they weren't hired, presumably because they're not the desirable labor force for this job, for whatever reason that is. But you made them equal to us and we bore the scorching heat of the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's something about that that reveals something of their, maybe it's not absurd, but it reveals something of their offense here. Like we deserve more, not because we work more, but we deserve more than them. Than mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. them. Yeah. And so it goes back to why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus? Right? Why do you spend all of your time with the losers? <laughs> why, why do you bless the poor in spirit when those of us who are rich in spirit can provide you a whole lot more? in this in this mission you've got planned. And that fits on an idea, first of all, of allowing the text to uh, interpret itself. Um, as we look at, um, you know, uh, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Um, and then the question, are you envious because I am generous? And, and so this is a, a display of an abundant grace, a generosity that you would not expect, especially from someone uh, who's trying to um, make a profit running the vineyard. And so one challenge of that is um, that this speaks to uh, the possibility in a culture of consumerism and a supply and demand and profit to be able to say, um, but because of my commitment to the grace of God, I will embody that kind of generosity, um, that I will look like um, what Jesus describes uh, this uh, vineyard owner as looking like. And that becomes absurd, as to use your word. And isn't that what we remember? Isn't that what stands out for us? Isn't that what we take notice of? We're, we, are, we are comfortable with abuse, because there is so much abuse going on. We are comfortable with oppression. We don't say anything about it. Looks like they didn't either. But when something generous happens, everybody stops, takes notice, and gives an account for it. 
maybe we need to be willing to do that in the same as we preach this text. Yeah, and I think too that that line of are are you envious because I'm generous? You know, most of your Bibles will have that little note that says it's you know in the Greek it reads, "Is your eye evil because I am good?" And I think that could be another homiletical lens through this passage is to start there in the way in which goodness is getting defined. Mm-hmm. What is mm-hmm. what does good mean? And and that goes back to your observation, your comment, Joy, in terms of how do we preach these parables that are not we don't turn them into allegories uh, so quickly, but but invite that pondering. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it maybe you leave people too with like, well, what then what is good about this parable? Like what what is the goodness here? Where is that goodness located? How would you define that goodness? And how is it that that God's goodness and the goodness of the kingdom uh, is being redefined and and re-embodied and renamed in ways that really challenge our idea of what good is? Uh, so that would be another, I think, an, another helpful angle on this passage. Well, this is where preaching the parables are so much more fun than writing an interpretive paper on the parables because yes. <laughs> yeah. you um, you get to follow their rhetoric, which might be playful, it might be offensive, it might be, here's the mystery. Uh, Jesus never promises that a parable is going to sew up the entire scope of the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is like, it resembles this. And he doesn't always exactly say, this is what it resembles. This is how it doesn't resemble. So there's this, we sometimes have a, an inclination that we're supposed to find the theological truth that we can extract from this and then say, here's the thing it's about, the one thing it's about. And sometimes that's true. And of course there's probably more than one thing, but sometimes it's an emotion. Mm-hmm. Or it could also, I remember this, it could also be seen as an emotion. So what does it feel like to be given a full day's wage when the system wouldn't allow you to work a full day to do what you had to do? What does it feel like to receive that kind of generosity? What does it feel like when you feel like I'm really not being noticed for my hard work and my gifts here? <laughs> you know, um I that feeling. Yeah. How do you like because <laughs> firstborn daughter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I've been laboring all day here in this household. Um, what has Emily done? What has Gwen done? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's to help a congregation sit with an emotion or a feeling or an awe. And I don't, that's easier for me to say than for each of you listening to pull off perhaps, but, but what is going? It's a powerful challenge, Matt, because as you said, we're so used for look, looking for that idea, communicating that one truth. And if there was one truth to be conveyed from these texts, we would have gotten it in the last 2,000 years, <laughs> <No>. maybe. <laughs> um, but, but what keeps us coming back? Um, what keeps us spending more money to go to a concert? What, what keeps us risking uh, to go uh, to uh, a, another event? It's, it's the feeling. Um, it's, it's when it becomes alive or causes me to recognize that I am alive. And uh, when, we, when we preach or teach in a way that is always in our head, we lose the very compassion Uh, that these texts are communicating. These texts in particular, or this text in particular. So I appreciate that. Well, speaking of parables, maybe we should go into Jonah. Um, (laughs) The the whole book's a bit of a parable. and It is. You know, the difficulty with this, I think we probably talk about this whenever the lectionary runs to Jonah for just one one quick sip. Right. But this is, you know, the the focus here on mercy and the focus on how God's mercy towards some might make you disappointed <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. or resentful. And so Jonah is this great example of that. But what I, what I really appreciate about this pairing is that it, uh, it illustrates what I think is at the heart of Matthew's gospel about mercy. Mm-hmm. I think that's the maybe the yeah. prime 
personality trait of Jesus in Matthew and of his message is really this abundance of mercy, which is odd for a gospel that wants to talk about judgment so much, I realize, but we'll save that for a future week. But it's the mercy of God is a, well, it's a strange thing, according to Graham Greene, I believe is the, the quote from a novel of his, but it's also really offensive sometimes. Well, in the case of uh, Jonah too, that, that, it, I, yes, angry enough to die. I mean, that, <laughs> like that. It's such a great tantrum, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it is. And you know, and and the whole thing about the bush is kind of hilarious. You know, he likes the bush, and then and the bush turns on him, and right. Um, <laughs> God's like, you're concerned about this bush, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, you're really concerned yeah. about the bush, and and yet. Look over here. This is, you know, this is what I've done over here, which in and of itself is like a little mini parable, right? Mm -hmm. that, that where is it that we locate our gaze in terms of God's goodness, the goodness of the kingdom, uh, the provision of God, and and yet and and the expectations of that provision or the expectations of that mercy. I think that's kind of what is happening here with Jonah, and and then that mercy gets put in 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 a in a way that just is almost incomprehensible or is so challenging to the ways in which we have um, anticipated or understood what God's mercy is like. And so that's, you know, that's also that that connection with the parable. So somehow if a sermon can also maybe name some of those expectations for people or how 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 might they how might they name their own expectations of how God is merciful. Um, where, where, do, where, where does God's grace? Where should it show up? Where do we expect it to show up? And then, what do we do when it's, you know, when it's given to others or to a situation that that really challenges that expectation? And how does it show mm -hmm. up? What is it supposed to look like? Um, mm -hmm. Um, if if you if you will, I'd like to offer a different uh, uh, take on this, um, and uh, it's um, it's looking at uh, this reality of um, well, first of all, the parallel that that Jonah's reaction is um, uh, parallel to the actions in in Jesus' parallel parable, um, anger at God's grace. Um, but something else that stood out to me is um, in both of these, and we'll see it again as we continue to read, um, God seems to be okay with this kind of honesty. That these, these, this, the, the Matthew parable um, has this engagement where the workers are speaking with the owner and the owner is engaging back. And here we have God who is extending this grace, having told Jonah, I want you to be the embodiment of my grace right now. And Jonah's like, I'm having nothing to do with it. And God entertains that attitude. God sits with Jonah in some ways. Um, some of your community might be going through a point of frustration. Uh, we laughed a moment ago and said, angry enough to die. But that might be exactly where some people are. They're just at the end of their emotional rope, their mental capacity, their personal willingness to think they can go on. And it might be worth knowing that God will sit with them even there and extend the grace to them that God is expecting us to, in a God-like fashion, extend to others. And that might be just enough to get you up one more day. And then don't try to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of the week. Just take that one day. There you yeah. go. Yeah. 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 Well, speaking of complaining. Yes. Uh, Exodus they do 16. I love that Anna Marsh's commentary reminded me that this is called a part of the book called The Murmuring Tradition, which I just love. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've had seasons of my life. They're like the murmuring era. <laughs> The whining, the, the whining decade. <laughs> the whining, yeah, the, the whining grumbling. decade. Oh my! <laughs> the grumbling years. There right. it is. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. Well, we're of course this is the yeah the semi continuous reading and the 
and and particularly i mean it 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 is kind of connected to what i was saying before about those of of those expectations of of god that um kind of mm, kind of trap us in a way or we we think that that god is going to act in a particular way or or that uh the direction that that is revealed about god's character it can be predicted and and yet here the israelites are you know they they uh thought things were going to go one way and and here they are and so um and i think also connected to what you were saying joy about the 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 capacity to complain (laughs) they get to to complain you know Um, yeah and and Moses, you know, as leader is probably, you know, that would be a whole different direction to consider what, you know, how leaders deal with complaint. Um, but Moses does go to, go to God on this one, but um, just just that putting this in its context, Israel has been enslaved under ruthless leaders, oppressed. Um, it took you know, literally the moving of heaven and hell to release them from slavery. And, you know, what was their imagination that this was going to to look like, that they were going to become the oppressors of someone else, um, that life was just going to be perfect and they would be, you know, the people in charge? No, they're going to have to learn how to live. Um, and it's not going to be handed to them on a silver platter but it might be handed to them on a dirt ground. Uh, and, and, and so there's, there's some earthiness, if I can dare to pun that a bit, uh, to this story uh, that this scene in, the, in their life is like, oh my gosh, send me back to a, a, a ruthless, unjust system just so I can eat good food um, rather than trusting that if God can overturn the greatest empire and the largest military that God might be able to provide food. Yeah. And uh, so putting it in that context as you read it as well. And then of course, the aside that I mentioned, another angle would be, what does it mean to be the leader of these people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's all golden. That's really good stuff. It's, it's so easy to kind of make fun of the complaining, you know, and, and to come, talk about them as whining and never satisfied, but you think of what they've gone through just, to, I mean, chapter before, yes. <laughs> um, which liberative, yes, but it's not like they've got a full blown Israelite religion that they're practicing in Egypt. They're like you said, joy under the thumb of the strong man, who's also a God, by the way, mm-hmm. in Egypt. I mean, there's, and so Moses is like, okay, here's this ritual eat this, put some blood in your doorpost. <laughs> they get through the sea and then they get through the sea, right? And Miriam and the women are the ones who then make this theological claim, God has done this. And now God's like, I'm going to send this stuff on the ground and you're going to know it's me who brought you out of Egypt. Because in a couple chapters, they're going to be worshiping a golden calf and it's yes. easy to make fun of them again. But religiously, they're trying to figure out like what in the world has gone on? Yeah, yeah. And have we made the biggest mistake of our lives? Yeah, sometimes and following this weird guy out here. So yeah, sometimes the hell we know is better yeah. than the heaven we don't know, or at yeah. least until we learn it. And I, I, I'm also struck by fifteen, uh, verse fifteen. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, "What is it?" Is this? Yes. Yeah, they didn't know which. I probably would ask too. I mean, you know, there might have been of- another word in there that got edited out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the? probably. Mm, probably. But, it, but it for they did not know what it was, and then Moses says to them, "It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat." And there's something about that exchange too that I think a preacher, our our, our listeners out there, might resonate with as well. Is that that our Mm, our sometimes inability to recognize that the provision from God, um, and 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 that and what is it that allows us or makes it possible for us to see it and to interpret it and to say, 
oh, I think I know what this is. Uh, and and how we do that for our congregations, but how do we do that for one another? And so that might be another homiletical angle that the preacher could take is, is inviting people into that sort of communal discernment space of, of provision and where we see that. And, um, and yeah, that would be another. That'd be another move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We should probably move on to the psalm. <clears throat> yes. Which has a lot. <laughs> you know, speaking of God's abundant goodness, which we've really seen in all the texts uh, so far, the um, media of generations as well. This strikes me. And you know, out of these weird old stories about these wandering Israelites mean anything to me in my life, right? And so how does this the stories that get get passed down aren't just about God's goodness. They're also about our human frailties and our complaints and our, um, our, our relived traumas of extraction from Egypt and trying to find one's way. Well, and nobody's, neither one of you and, uh, and our listeners are not going to be surprised that I would somehow use this liturgically <laughs> uh, because you just have these great, you know, as, as the commentary says, it's a, a doxological psalm of of giving uh, of of recognizing the blessings from God, and that this is this is the this is the nature of God's character is graciousness and mercy, and so whether you bring this language into your sermon in talking about the parable in, of the workers in the vineyard and or or about Jonah or or the Exodus text uh, that this is you know our God is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love that that's that in all of these stories that characteristic of God is being is being manifested and or to use it as a you know, toward the end of the service or something like that as a, as a, as a blessing, as a reminder, you know, to, that when people leave the, the gathering or the, the listening that uh, we need these reminders of our Lord is gracious and merciful. We have a merciful God. Uh, and do we really believe that? Do people actually believe that that we have a God of mercy, especially when you listen to how people talk about God. And, and, and that's often, I think one of the, one of the things that I talk about a lot with my students is that, you know, we make these claims about, about the church or about, um, you know, who's in and who's out and, 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 and without really stopping and saying, well, what are you saying about God then? Who is God for you if this is what you're going to hold on to in terms of how the church works or or who, you know, who who is saved and who is not? We don't as we don't often then pull back and then say, well then tell me who your God is. And so to remind people as they're leaving your God, our God is a God of mercy. How might that change their their way of being that week? Even that one claim, that one reminder, your God is a God of mercy. And then how is it that they don't hear that during the week? Um, how is it that that's not the primary characteristic of God that is lifted up in most in so much of our theological discourse? I really appreciate that. And as you've done this, Caroline, to bridge that across any of the text for this week, um, it's a reminder that while we may be reading this or hearing this in a moment of our distress, uh, at a, in a year of our complaint, is that what you said, Matt? Um, but that the reason we have these stories is because Israel has been testifying to this good God. So these stories are not written to say, and this is why you shouldn't believe in God. They're written to say, and this is why we do believe in God. And so the words here are words of that I will trust in you. Uh, th this, this is Israel's response. Ultimately, this even becomes Jonah's response. Um, 
the reason that um, Jesus had so many followers is because even after these difficult texts, uh, these difficult words, people were able to say, I, I trust in this graciousness of God, and I will put myself in his on his side. Um, I really appreciate that. Philippians. Philippians. We've got four readings from Philippians, and this might be a, a direction that a preacher might want to go in, especially as you think about how congregations are are coming back. Uh, we have it just a couple of weeks ago had welcome Sundays, welcome back Sundays, and programming starts up, and uh, and the way in which uh, the Philippians, the this letter of Paul to the Philippians uh, might be really an animating uh, an animating text for people with regard to uh, what are some of the primary ways in which we envision Christ's work um, and and the and and the purpose of uh, the of, of this of who is this Jesus that we believe in and and I think also if you know, this is looking ahead to the the later pericope of of you get Paul's direct words to the leaders, right, in Philippi. But I I I would also um, encourage preachers just to hear Paul's words for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, just to hear these words as I mean, yes, to your congregation, but uh, but also just to hear. Um, to hear these claims about Jesus that are just so central to who we are and what we believe. I just let the words kind of wash over you before you like figure out what they mean. <laughs> right, 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 right. The, um, the letter, it's interesting, the, the passages that were chosen to, to summarize Philippians, we're gonna get language like living your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We're going to talk about imitating Christ and his refusal to exploit his power. We're going to talk about working out salvation and fear and trembling. We're going to talk about I believe, pressing on, you know, that's, it's, it's a very, it's a deeply pastoral letter to a community that Paul really, really loves and really cares for. And really he wants to be their pastor from afar, not in a power hungry sense, you know, but he, he wants to imbue them with the best of what he has to offer. And he's happy to take joy from them as well in return. But it's, but it's a, it's a letter that is uh, sometimes a nice, kind of nice kick in the pants in our Protestant behinds, right? That uh, yes, God is gracious. God is merciful. Um, but there's, a trajectory this gospel puts you on mm -hmm. and God will empower you. God will be the force behind all of this. But uh, he thinks the Philippians haven't experienced the, the best of times yet and is trying to help them figure that out. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tender letter. It's a beautiful letter. It's also a really challenging letter for me in that regard. There's a tying together again of each of the texts that would be uh, a, a thought-provoking way of looking at Philippians. Um, and, and just this week along in this particular text, what would make Paul communicate these words to these people in this time? Well, as you've said, Matt, um, Paul believes they haven't seen their best moment yet. Jesus is saying to first century Israel, you haven't seen your best moment yet. Jonah is being told by God, "This you haven't seen the best moment yet. Moses is saying to the Israelites, you haven't seen the best moment yet. And so in some ways, what Paul is doing here is exactly what each of the other texts this week are doing. And you could use lines from Paul's letter back into the other scenes, uh, or you could uh, buoy up your presentation of Paul's letter by reminding your listeners that Paul has in his imagination these Hebrew scriptures, these scenes, and he's bringing them alive for his context of people he loves that want, he wants to trust in a gracious God.